I'm Adrian Kale. I'm a wildlife filmmaker. I've spent years travelling the globe filming some of the world's most fascinating creatures. But right now, I'm just a stone's throw from London, England. And here, in this leafy paradise, I've discovered something quite extraordinary. Just behind this nonchalant looking farm shop is something that is very un English. Oh! Oh! A secret world of snow leopards. Mm. And lots of them. Oh, hello. Dr. Terry Moore runs the Cat Survival Trust, a haven for all cats and home to one of the biggest collections of snow leopards on the planet. With snow leopard numbers falling rapidly in the wild, each one of these endangered cats here is special, and each birth, precious. Come with me and meet the snow leopards of leafy London. Behind this thriving farm shop, we find Dr. Terry Moore. He was a young man when he saw a wild cat on sale in a London department store that would change his life forever. Moved by its plight, he dedicated the rest of his life to saving cats and set up the Cat Survival Trust in 1977. This was a really passionate decision. As time has gone on, my passion has blossomed. The trust was set up as a charity to rescue wild cats that could no longer be looked after by either private owners or zoos. Since starting the trust, several hundred cats, both domestic and exotic, have been taken in. As a result, over 240 of those exotic cats have subsequently been bred here. The relationship that you can build with a cat in many ways is stronger than quite often you can build with a human. If you can build that respect and understanding, then they have nothing to fear from you and you have nothing to fear from them. While the Trust offers sanctuary to all species of cat, Terry has become particularly intrigued by the elusive snow leopard. Whilst I'm very passionate about all cats, the snow leopard still retains its mystery. We still know very little about them. There is just something magical about the snow leopard. Its stunning coat and so-called medicinal bones are highly prized and numbers in the wild are falling dramatically. Snow leopards have bred here in the past, but their continued decline means Terry wants to take it to another level. His plan is to breed lots of them and to release some back to the wild. This is Kamal. He's really the, the old boy of the collection, I suppose you could say. He's about 14, very calm, very stable. He's quite happy to be groomed with my brush that I always carry around with me. He's a real character. Kamal is currently sharing his enclosure with his slightly grumpy youngest daughter, Nina. They have recently been separated from Kamal's partner and Nina's mother, Urbis, as she is soon expecting her latest litter of cubs. And they are feeling a bit sorry for themselves. But just two days before I arrived here at the sanctuary, one of the volunteers filmed the three of them living as a blissfully happy family. Here's Dad. Morning, Nina. Morning, Mum. Kamal is uh, the mate of Irvis. They're a very, very dedicated couple. They absolutely adore each other. It's something that's really nice to see. 
and I think perhaps a few humans could learn from the way cats behave. When you see this dedication between two animals, it, it is just magical. This is Arbis. Arbis has been with us uh, about 13 years now. Arbis has been uh, very friendly uh, ever since she's been here. I have a, a particular method that I use to approach any cat, and she's one that became totally respectful of me and totally trustworthy. And as you see, she's very calm. Uh, she's a very good mother. She's been perfect with her first two litters, no problems at all. And we're very hopeful that before long, she's going to produce her third litter. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Erbus's last litter arrived at the Trust two years ago. Three precious tiny cubs born to Erbis and Kamal, one of whom was Nina. The trust that Erbis has of Terry meant he was able to handle the cubs just hours after birth. Within weeks, the cubs were out and about with Terry, exploring the English countryside. Of the 240 cats born at the Trust, 20 of them have been snow leopards. Their importance to the long-term survival of the species means they get special treatment every time. Sadly, a warm and humid summer had a disastrous outcome when it caused Nina's two siblings to contract pneumonia. Both died within weeks of each other. With snow leopards endangered in the wild, this made Nina all the more precious and all the more spoiled. As Terry kept a close watch on her throughout the equivalent of her teenage cat years, Weighing just a few hundred grams at birth, snow leopards grow up fast. Males can reach a whopping 55 kilos, and females an equally impressive 40 kilos. Nina is now just over two years old and is almost ready to become a mother herself, when she will play a vital role in the Trust's unique snow leopard breeding project. As the farm shop goes about its daily business, suburban shoppers pop in and out, oblivious to the secret world of wildcats behind the bags of pet food. With all the excitement of the imminent arrival of cubs, it's down to ex-military man and cat manager Rob Martin to carry out the day-to-day -day tasks at the sanctuary. I normally give the water bowls uh, a weekly scrub. I like to encourage uh, the algae to grow in the bowls because uh, most of the cats actually like the taste of the algae in the water. But after a while, in sunlight, of course, the, the green algae does grow quite a lot. So I just clean it out and start from scratch. As an army man, Rob spent many years in Asia where he developed a passion for wild cats. He has now gone from serving queen and country to serving his beloved cats. Right now, he's busy preparing a very important snack with a difference. A lot of the food we give to our cats is wild, uh, wild deer, rabbits, hares, and uh, uh, there is a possibility that they may have worms. And we worm all our cats every month or two. Today, it's uh, the jaguar and the amo leopard's turn. This is a um, box standard wormer uh, for cats. Once I have the right dosage, I just pump the, the wormer underneath the skin and then just pop up the top and, and feed each cat. One cat that has missed out on worming today is expectant mum Irvis. With the birth of her next litter getting close, 
Rob cannot risk giving her even this simple medicine. Every snow leopard birth here is invaluable and will go on to play a vital role in the Trust's planned snow leopard breeding project. The race is on. These guys are putting down the finishing touches on building new enclosures that will be at the heart of a groundbreaking snow leopard breeding project. With the purpose of securing the future of snow leopards in the wild, this project is a world first. Sadly, snow leopards in the wild are falling in numbers. And we have a unique opportunity now to take cubs from here and set up a breeding complex in Sikkim in northern India. And the second generation that we produce there will be released back into the wild. Our plan here is to construct a brand new complex for the snow leopard breeding project. It's probably the most advanced of all the enclosures that we've ever built here, using uh, materials which are designed to last. Recycled plastic for door frames and window frames, very substantial telegraph poles, and we need to get this uh, new complex up and running as soon as possible for the next stage of our program. The next stage is to move all five female snow leopards that live here into these two new enclosures. All the girls have a very important role to play. That's twins, Shen and Sharma, old girl, Tammy, sweet and gentle, Amiga, and you've already met Nina with the plan later this year to introduce them to some unrelated males. There's something very good about being involved with a project where we're going to be breeding cats whose young will be back in the wild where they should be. As the ladies contemplate their house move, Rob has got his hands full in the lynx enclosure. As with most animals, they eat a lot and they also a lot. So um, today is the day that um, I de-poo. With Rob carrying out manure manoeuvres, customers continue to drift in and out of the suburban farm shop, unaware of the cat stories unfolding before them. Some take an interest, though not in the snow leopards. Nice camera, yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah. Expensive one, look at me. With the shop doing a roaring trade, Terry takes charge of a very um, interesting delivery. Here we have a wallaby, which uh, was the property of a local animal collection. It's not the first time we've had an unusual animal to provide some food for our cats. Sadly, this one died of natural causes. So, twist this one off. And as it had no veterinary treatment at all, no veterinary drugs, it's ideal meat for our cats. I think you'll find there's several of them watching this procedure, particularly the jaguar. The jaguar is very excited by the prospect of some fresh meat. And the head is going to the jaguar. All cats are carnivores and have to eat meat, sometimes regardless of its unorthodox origin. Once the wallaby has been dissected, Terry goes about distributing the various parts. He nonchalantly carries raw meat into the den of hungry big cats. There you are. Of the two female North American pumas, Kit Kat, the mother, grabs a leg and heads off first. Crunchy, her rather glamorous daughter, is a little more hesitant. But as Kit Kat chews through the wiry fur of her Antipodean dinner, Crunchy eventually decides to give this unusual meal a go. Terry then delivers a special gift to Athena, the jaguar. It is going to be intriguing to find out 
just exactly whether they'll accept wallaby meat because we've never fed wallaby meat to any of our cats. Immediately picking up the wallaby's tail, Athena has no qualms about the meat. She's just a little shy when it comes to people watching her eat her food. <laughs> Back outside, it's soon to be Dad Kamal, who's last on Terry's wallaby delivery schedule. His calls are to his absent partner, Hervis. She doesn't respond. So Terry aims to distract him with this tasty dinner, designed to put a spring back in his step. Kamal tucks into his first ever taste of wallaby and seems to have forgotten, momentarily, about his troubles. Over in the cat house, there is muted excitement. Urbis's behaviour has changed and she has become much more secretive than usual. Of course, in the wild, snow leopard do search out somewhere in peace and quiet away from any other uh, snow leopards or any other uh, animals ready to give birth. Herbis is spending much more time inside. She knows that this birth is imminent and that few days inside is certainly giving her the assurance that she has somewhere in peace and quiet where she can give birth quite safely. Every birth is special, particularly when you've got a snow leopard that I have so much trust in and has so much trust in me. So I'm particularly looking forward to the next three or four days because I find every birth to be really the pinnacle of the work we do here. The farm shop opens early and shelves are stocked full of goodies, ready for a busy day ahead. Out back, the warmth of the early morning sunshine has brought most of the truss 10 snow leopards out to soak up the rays. But there are two exceptions. Expectant Mum Erbis has stayed indoors. Keeping herself in the cool darkness of her indoor den is a strong indication that she is almost ready to give birth. After a three month wait, her pregnancy is finally at full term. Any day now, Terry expects to see a litter of two or three cubs. Moving a cat here is never easy, but Terry has a wealth of ideas to call upon. Where better to start than with the most simple? He and James are maneuvering a cat box down to the old cat house as first to move is four-year-old Amiga. Amiga is one of the females we've bred here so far, one of the seven litters. She is going to be mated up with a male with, with totally different genetics, and that will enable us to send some really important stock out to India. Terry's success in breeding these endangered cats has resulted in the development of a breeding program in India that could see snow leopards released back to the wild. Any cubs produced by the females at the Trust will be the first exported to the Indian snow leopard project he is establishing. But before any thoughts of future litters can be considered, first, they need to get Amiga into the cat box. The method we use here is quite different to many collections. We prefer not to dart animals unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, there is a certain amount of risk with anaesthetizing a cat and we don't want to run any risk at all. As Amiga waits patiently inside, Terry and his team are placing the carry box directly in front of the hatch that leads to our outdoor enclosure. The plan is simple. Open the hatch and wait for her to walk through. Go! And there she goes. Amiga, as a full-grown female, weighs just under 40 kilograms. 
she throws all of that weight against the walls of the carry box. It doesn't take her long to settle down. Once up at the new enclosure, Terry employs one of his tried and tested methods. A few simple attachments of string and an open window create an ingenious pulley system. All that is needed to get Amiga safely out of the box and into her new home. That's absolutely brilliant. She's settled in immediately. She's just doing a bit of exploring. Well, that was a textbook transfer of cat. Just a stone's throw from London, it's a grey start to the day at the Cat Survival Trust. But there is promise of sunshine as clouds start to break up. Before getting on with today's big task of moving Nina and her dad Kamal, Terry checks up on mum-to-be Irvis. I think it could be tonight. Her nipples are up. She's spent a lot of time in the past few days inside, moving the straw around. I think later this evening, we're due for some cabs. Containing his excitement about the imminent births, Terry checks on all the girls that moved enclosures yesterday. The twins and Tammy seem totally settled, but Amiga is acting somewhat out of character. <coughs> I think after that move in that crate, she's still a bit nervous as to what's going to happen next. But by tomorrow, I would guarantee that she'll be totally settled and she'll be ready to eat that chicken. Nina, at two years old, is now of breeding age, so must soon be separated from her dad, Kamal, to prevent inbreeding. In the next few weeks, she will have to move out from her dad's enclosure and move in with the other young female, Amiga, and the two will be introduced to a new male. Once he's got a taste, he might come in for some more. But for today, the plan is simply to move father and daughter into an interim enclosure before they are separated for good. Tempting them with chicken would normally get them moving. So we have a very sleepy Nina. So we're going to try just one leg, drop from the top onto the platform just in front of her in the hope that that might get her taste buds going. We have a perfect example of a 21 hour siesta. Let's face it, it's the thing that cats do best. Always with another plan up his sleeve, Terry heads off to fetch Nina's favorite treat food. It's still chicken, but this time it's out of a packet. We're now going to bait the corridor so that we can make sure that the cat comes into the corridor, but far enough in so that we can shut the end door and hopefully then the first cat will come through and into the next enclosure. Outside, Nina has found a hiding place and watches closely as the team put their cunning plan into action. Her dad, Kamal, is tempted by the drumsticks. But moving is all too much effort. Cats own us, and when they're ready to do something, they'll do it. So we have to respect the needs of every single cat. The clock is ticking, and Kamal and Nina have still not walked into their new enclosure, the downside of a non-darting policy here at the Trust. So Terry's decided to open a series of hatches, leaving it up to them to walk through to their new enclosure when they feel like it. But as the night starts to draw in, the day isn't about to end. The special moment Terry has been waiting for is finally happening. Kamal's partner, and Nina's mum, Urbis, has started her contractions. And Terry is instantly by her side, calling to reassure her. Urbis has always been quite happy for me to be in the vicinity. I don't know whether she finds it reassuring, but... Uh, I can certainly make the right noises. 
Ow. Ow. The way, the way she's laying there at the moment, you, you would think she was my wife. Contractions are now shortening. She's beginning to push against the wall. We're not far off now. But three hours have now passed, and Urbis has still not delivered her cubs. Her previous births have been much quicker. We could have a very large cub. She's certainly pushing hard. So I'm not unduly worried at this stage, but there's just a little bit of doubt in my mind as to why it's taken quite so long. I might get you to go and get me a cup of tea and coffee just to keep me awake, but I'm here for however long it takes. <laughs> Another two hours pass, and Urbis is exhausted. But at last, there are positive signs. I can actually see that um, she's broken her waters now, so uh, this means that uh, we are very close now. And the first one's out. But Terry's joy is short-lived. It doesn't seem to be moving. It was a full eight hours after starting her contractions that Urbis finally gave birth to her first cub. <clears throat> Devastatingly, it hadn't survived the long and arduous labor. Understandably, a distressed Terry asked me to leave. This, this is something that's never happened before here. So please, can you shut the cameras off and, and I'm gonna go in. Yesterday was a complete disaster. One of those rare things that happens occasionally with animals, whether they're bred in captivity or in the wild, happened here yeah. yesterday. Urbis had given birth to one dead cub, and it was quite obvious that she was having difficulty passing a further cub and was getting very weak. <coughs> so we decided the best thing was to take her to the local vet to do an x-ray and to investigate if, if there was going to be further problems with any other cubs. <laughs> Sadly, when we arrived at the vet, while we were preparing to do the x-ray, she just faded away. Uh, one minute she was very lively, still obviously in distress, but then with literally a few gasps, she just passed away. An X-ray taken after Urbis died showed that the two cubs remaining in her womb had started to decompose. The three cubs that she was carrying must have been very active, which had caused their umbilical cords to get twisted and tangled, cutting off each of their blood and nutrient supplies. All three cubs had died days before Urbis even started her contractions. Their tiny dead bodies then poisoned their mother, and Urbis was unable to survive. It was a natural disaster that no one could have foreseen. With Urbis, I suppose you could say that she may well have been the closest friend I've ever had, because the respect and trust between us was extra special. No, I mean, it, it all floods back, you know, think about the relationship I had. That's life, isn't it?
This is a major setback for the Snow Leopard breeding project. So there is now an urgent need for others to start breeding. But despite the drama, the farm shop remains open for business as usual. What well, didn't one get out? Where's the Terry has to now look to the other female snow leopards to move the Indian breeding project forward. His first thoughts turn to Urbis's youngest daughter, Nina. She will now have to pick up where her mother left off. Terry's asked cat keeper Mikey to begin the long process by first separating her from dad Kamal. Nina has now reached the age where they would naturally seek independence from their parents and siblings in the wild. She's also getting close to the age of sexual maturity, so for those reasons, it's time to, to move her away from her father. As with humans, breeding with those that are genetically too close can cause many problems. And so in order to give any future snow leopards born at the Trust a chance of survival in the wild, they must be genetically diverse. Nina is to be moved into the breeding enclosure next door. There, she will live with another female she has never met before, four-year-old Amiga. And Mikey has enlisted cat manager Rob to help carry out what may be a time-consuming task, encouraging her to move home all by herself. I'm going to get a, a, a nice piece of meat and just put it by the door here. So um, hopefully the smell will just waft out and uh, that'll just increase our chances. But it seems the flies are more interested in the meat than Nina is. Next door, Amiga sits quietly, watching. Amiga is actually Nina's older sister. She was born in a previous litter and on growing up was moved into her own enclosure. As such, she and Nina have never met. Unlike Nina, she is a very gentle and non-aggressive snow leopard. As she sits, I get a fantastic opportunity to really see her distinctive features. Like all snow leopards, she has rounded short ears, which help reduce heat loss, and her wide, short nasal cavity is purpose-built to heat cold air quickly before it enters her lungs. With her distinctively freckled nose and perfect features, Amiga is the epitome of a perfect snow leopard. She and Nina will be at the heart of the breeding project that Terry hopes will see snow leopards introduced back to the wild. Back next door, and Rob is putting into practice another of his trusty tricks. He may look like he's spearfishing, but he's in no way hurting Nina. It's just gentle encouragement. It doesn't take long, as, fed up with all the prodding and disturbance, Nina heads inside in the hope of some peace and quiet. While everything's quiet and no one's around, I just thought I'd uh, pop up and, and have a look, see if she's moved across. And uh, as you can see, she's, um, well, she's asleep, so she's <laughs> obviously very comfortable. <laughs> Snow leopards are known to be nocturnal, so under the cover of darkness, Nina made her move across while Amiga is still locked inside. The plan is this morning to introduce Amiga to Nina. Although they are from previous litters, they are two cats which have never met each other before. So we envision a little bit of a swearing and a bit of a confrontational sort of behavior. Amiga has just woken up. I'm just about to feed Omega the whole chicken to keep her full up uh, with food so she's less confrontational when she actually finally meets Nina. But after just one cursory sniff of the chicken, it looks like Amiga is not in the friendliest of moods. As I leave Amiga to calm down, the farm shop is now open and it's business as usual. You didn't warn me I was going to be a film star. It's been a tough few days for Terry with the loss of Urbis, one of his most treasured snow leopards and her cubs. But there is little time for sorrow when you have a back garden full of wild cats. First on his list is to visit Kamal, who was Urbis's partner for many years. Terry and Kamal have a shared loss. This morning, um, off to give Kamal a, a 
bit of a groom. I've always had a, a direct contact with a number of cats here. It does make keeping them here a lot easier in captivity. Of course, preferably all cats should be in the wild, but at least if we can keep the cats at ease whilst they're with us, then the cats are much happier and healthier. She's ready for a bit of massage. No? He wants the other side done. And here's the sharp end of the cat. This is the bit you don't want to have any contact with. It's not that he would actually be particularly dangerous with me, um, but sadly, I don't have this thick fur to protect me from uh, those claws. And whilst normally cats playing together wouldn't inflict any damage to each other, um, with me having no fur, uh, I wouldn't have much of a chance. Over at the breeding enclosure, everything is set for the introduction of Nina and Amiga. I'm going to be going into the enclosure myself. I'm going to take a broom, not to protect myself, but just in case. So I need a broom just to help separate them if, if we do get a, a violent reaction. Snow leopards are powerful predators that can inflict serious harm on each other and us. Other collections would never dream of entering a big cat enclosure like this during an introduction. But Terry trusts his cats and takes everything in his stride. A risky business. With Nina still snoozing on top of the platform, it's up to Amiga to come out and introduce herself. It's not usual in the wild for female snow leopards to share territory. And Nina's instincts are kicking in. Submissive Amiga doesn't want to fight. And goes to see what she can find out about this new unfriendly housemate. All she's doing is checking out the smells from Nina. The beauty about this is that because Nina has, uh, when she's urinated and defecated in here, she hasn't been under stress, so those won't contain threatening smells. The pheromones they produce can indicate to another cat whether that cat is aggressive or not. So she's picking up that, hey, this isn't an aggressive cat, so you know, um, perhaps I'll have another approach and see if we can be friends. But Nina is on her way down to see Amiga. <coughs> Amiga, by rubbing up against the walls and showing Nina her head, is displaying submissive behaviour. With Nina's back turned, Amiga sees an opportunity to get her own back. <laughs> Thank you. 
it will take time for them to work out each other's boundaries. Omega is quite happy to be friends. She's just wanting to, to get close to show that she's not want, she doesn't want to be there. No, no. She has a message to me. While everyone is on tender hooks, Terry is the coolest cat around, even taking time out to answer his mobile phone. Hello. As Amiga walks away, Nina is still wound up and turns her attention to the other strangers in her enclosure, us. We have nothing to worry about. We are protected by Terry's trusty broom. And Nina soon turns her attention back to Amiga. It may take time for Nina to fully accept Amiga as her housemate, but once they are comfortable with each other, they'll be introduced to an unrelated male in the hope that at least one of them will mate and produce cubs. As the day ends, it's difficult to forget that, so recently, we lost Erbis and her cubs, something Terry will take time to overcome. The farm shop is already open for business, and customers are starting to drift in, unaware of the wild world waking up before them. The local police have phoned, and uh, They've got a deer for us, so we're going to have to drop everything and uh, go and pick up another deer. Something that happens quite frequently, fortunately, because our cats do love deer. Ah, oh, there we are. There Just it is. Just ahead, yeah. Cool. They have hidden it well. That's good. And let's Make load it up. up. It's not uncommon for the local authorities to contact Terry when animals hit by cars are left on the roadside. Poor old boy. Terry's clean-up service removes the risk of further accidents and offers a natural recycling solution in the process. Back at the trust, Rob prepares the cat food in a very matter-of-fact way. Firstly, I'm going to take the four legs off, the four legs and uh, the hind legs. Uh, the hind legs are really good. They have lots of meat around the thigh region. Once that's done, I'm going to take the neck off. Rob has saved some of the best parts for the girls. He's given them a couple of legs and um, the head. The twins get a bit excited at the prospect of a fresh dinner. Although aren't entirely sure who should go to the table first. Tammy, the eldest, dominates the other two so would normally get first dibs on the food. But she's nowhere to be seen. So Sharma takes the rare opportunity to move in first on the kill. Although wary if Tammy were to approach, her sibling, Shen, offers no such threat. So when food's around, sisterly love goes out the window and she helps herself to the lion's share. In the wild, snow leopards kill, on average, one large animal twice a month. Most active at dawn and dusk, they are opportunistic predators, feeding on bite-sized snacks such as birds and hares, as well as killing large prey like ibex in Russia and barrel sheep in the Himalayas. In Tammy's absence, Sharma has struck gold. Meanwhile, Shen is also quick to take advantage of the missing bully, diving headfirst into her own ready meal. The meat on a deer's head may not be quite as plentiful as that of the legs, but for lowly ranked Shen, it's a welcome treat. One which she's happy to stick her neck out for. The girls may take hours, maybe even days, to gnaw through their lunchtime treat. So I'm heading over to find a stick and, naturally, a hairbrush. He's almost certainly going to swear. 
Clambering into a small enclosure with a wild puma is not normal. Just stay there. Stay there. As Terry enters the enclosure, he uses soothing tones to try and calm the new arrival, who is clearly unhappy at the intrusion. Let's get down to your height, because you don't like me being high, do you? It's very useful for cats to accept me. If you need to examine them once they've accepted that they're not under threat, it's a lot easier to do this rather than knock them out all the time, which is something I just don't agree with. And if you can build this trust, and I can see after a while, I mean, he, he can probably be almost to the point of being picked up. The thin piece of wood has a rough surface, which Terry believes emulates a puma mother's tongue, potentially reassuring the cat in the process. The way to gain trust is peace and quiet, slow movements, and no aggression whatsoever. This is submission. Um, not quite submissive just yet. Unusual they may be, but Terry believes in his methods and has been down this road many times with wild cats. His lack of fear and calming demeanor seem to resonate with the puma. There's a good boy. Incredibly, in a reasonably short space of time and before my own eyes, Terry looks to have gained the trust of the puma. As he brushes with a hairbrush, it's so easy to forget that this is a wild animal. What a good boy. It's quite incredible to witness Terry at work. What a good boy. His methods may be unorthodox, but the patience, love and respect he has for these animals oh, is unquestionable. That's heaven. Yeah. Well, that is a very good example of the building of a relationship. That is trust. To be able to shut your eyes when there's a human right next to you show us that this cat is going to become a really good friend. The new friend has been christened Toffee, in line with the confectionery cat theme of the female pumas Kit Kat and Crunchy. After bonding with the new puma, Terry is keen to introduce him to the two females. Peeking outside for the first time since arriving, Toffee has a good look around. The two females, Kit Kat and Crunchy, are locked inside to allow the new arrival to get familiar with their smells. In unknown territory, instinct drives the puma to seek higher ground. The added height offers security and allows any potential danger to be spotted first. As is usual at the Cat Survival Trust, Terry is in the enclosure, keeping a close eye on the action. With Toffee up high, he decides to release the first female, Kit Kat. Normally, we would expect to see Kit Kat scent marking to delineate her territory, but she simply keeps on the move. Maybe the fact that Terry and I are in here as well could be confusing her a little. He's doing what any human would do, meeting a new person who's assessing the situation. He's seen no aggression from the, uh, the female, uh, but naturally he's going to be cautious because she's somewhat bigger than he is. Listening to Terry, it would appear he is now convinced that Toffee is a male. I'm now confident that we brought back a male. I've had a good check, so I'm very happy. Just as Toffee takes a hissing timeout, it's time for Crunchy, Kit Kat's stunning daughter, to make her appearance. More cautious than her mum, Crunchy hesitates. But as Toffee hisses from the platform, Crunchy slowly moves out to join Kit Kat in a united show of indifference towards the newcomer. I think it's time now to leave him alone to get used to his new friends, who, well, after all, have just acquired a new toy boy. 
But far from finished for the day, Terry is keen to introduce me to a good friend. Hello. What have I got for you, Kato? Kato is the male snow leopard that has been selected to be introduced to Amiga and Nina in the hope of providing cubs that could see the initiation of Terry's Indian breeding project. He's playing games. Come on, boy. Whoa. Look. Silly boy. What at first appears to me to be aggression is actually far from it. There we are. That's it. Look. Well, it's the first time he's seen me today, so he always is very excited for the first time each day. Aren't you, boy? Hey, you're a silly boy. Kato was born here. He was the first male that was born here. And uh, until he was 18 months old, he used to walk free around the farm and follow me. He's uh, a bit too big now to let out and walk around. <laughs> I love it when he does that. With his cloudy left eye, Kato is very distinctive. As a cub, his sister accidentally pulled his eye out of its socket while they were playing. Terry managed to save the eye, but it healed with some moisture under the lens leaving Kato with only partial sight. But he is still a stunning looking snow leopard. Kato is a real old softy, but he's going to be very important to our work here. I'm Adrian Kale. I'm a wildlife filmmaker. I've spent years traveling the globe, filming some of the world's most fascinating creatures. But right now, I'm just a stone's throw from London, England. And here, in this leafy paradise, I've discovered something quite extraordinary. Just behind this nonchalant-looking farm shop is something that is very un-English. Oh! Oh! A secret world of snow leopards. Mm. And lots of them. Oh, hello. Dr Terry Moore runs the Cat Survival Trust, a haven for all cats, and home to one of the biggest collections of snow leopards on the planet. With snow leopard numbers falling rapidly in the wild, each one of these endangered cats here is special, and each birth, precious. Come with me and meet the snow leopards of leafy London. Winter has arrived with a vengeance at the Trust, turning the whole of the cat sanctuary into a picture postcard, covered in a blanket of snow. The birds and the geese are out and about foraging for food, fighting each other as well as the cold. And in typical British fashion, no sooner has the snow settled than it starts to melt. And while lots of the cats aren't very happy about the wintry conditions, our snow leopards have really come into their own. With their coats thickening for the winter, they have no problem keeping warm in these colder climes. Their long tails, which are up to one metre in length, almost the same length as their bodies, are used throughout the year for balance. But in winter, they have an extra use acting as a built-in blanket, wrapping their tails around themselves to keep the chill at bay. Their wide, fur-covered feet act as natural snowshoes, preventing them from sinking into the snow and allowing them to move freely around the snow-covered ranges of their natural mountain habitats across Central and Southern Asia. It's been some time since the two young females, Amiga and Nina, were introduced to each other, and it's not been the easiest of relationships. Terry decided to put the young girls together in preparation for moving forward with his breeding program in India, hoping that they would bond. 
Unfortunately, Nina has been consistently aggressive towards Amiga, and only a few days ago, as the light was going, I captured a moment when Nina struck out at Amiga. <laughs> The result of which is that Amiga is now sporting a scar across her nose as a reminder of the day when Nina's vicious nature really came to the fore. Today, there's still an atmosphere with the two females. Despite Amiga's willingness to get along with the young, feisty Nina, there is little let up in her aggression. And things may well be stirred up again, as Terry plans to introduce the male snow leopard who has been chosen to pair with them for breeding, Kato. Terry has had Kato on standby, waiting in the wings for the right moment to move him across to the enclosure. As the breeding season is imminent, the females will be coming into heat, so the time to move is now. Part of the ongoing work here at the Trust is ensuring all the animals are kept in the best possible condition and free from illness. Now that's particularly important for three of our cats, Nina, Amiga and Kato, as Terry is hoping they'll breed this season. Now, for those of you with a delicate disposition, I suggest you um, look away now. Well, today is uh, one of our routine checks of faecal matter. That's uh, poo to the uninitiated. Today we're going to collect some samples from Amiga, Kato and Nina. Fecal samples are very important uh, to check snow leopard poo um, on a regular basis and all the cats here to make sure that the worming regime that we have is working. It can also throw up additional information which could be an early warning of uh, a possible problem in the future. While the snow leopards relax in the sunshine, waiting to pass their medical, Terry has returned to his kitchen table to get on with the job in his typical matter-of-fact way. The uh, process here is to suspend a dollop of poo from uh, Omega, Kato and Nida in separate tubes. And ultimately what we're looking for, and hope we don't find, uh, larvae, eggs, from parasites. Initially, we have to centrifuge a mixture with ordinary water to separate these small particles within the mixture. And just as everything is going to plan... I normally at this stage use a sieve, a 100 gauge or 150 gauge sieve. I can't remember where I put it last time, so... I wonder if I could use that. I'm going to have to use this tea strainer, which will do the job, um, because we need to make sure we don't get any large particles in this. Just remember to wash it before you make a cup of tea, Terry. I think this is going to end up in, in my uh, equipment. And then back to the business in hand with fully tea strained samples. Once any possible eggs and larvae and so on are separated, we can then go on with uh, a salt solution. Uh, all, all the larvae and eggs and so on will float to the top of the test tube and uh, this will enable us to collect any of those floating bodies on a cover slip and then we can check with the microscope to see if, if there's a high infestation or not. After thoroughly checking the samples, the results show that the constant vigilance of the cat keepers pays off as Kato, Amiga and Nina are declared fit and clear of infestation. You're looking at one happy snow leopard caretaker. All three are safe, so we're ready for a breeding season with our three snow leopards for this year. Well, the poo is all good. Therefore, the three snow leopards have been declared fit. 
Now, Kato has been moved up to his new home, ready to be released. Nina and Amiga have been moved inside and will meet Kato soon. Now, this is a first for our man of the moment, who has spent a lot of time living on his own. Kato! We've planned and planned. Um, everything's gone so smoothly, but we've just mis misjudged just one small factor. Um, the box just won't go through the door. <laughs> After a bit of quick rethinking, Kato is eventually released into the enclosure, and Terry watches on with interest. Kato makes a beeline for a branch, which must be covered in the scents of Amiga or Nina. Smelling the female scents launches Kato into a full-on display of scent marking. Scent marking is a, a critical part of uh, the behavior of cats. They establish a territory, they try and maintain that territory with the scent marking, and it's also the signal for any females in the area to hang around because this is the time of the year when, when they mate. They produce a, a pheromone during the mating season which keeps all these cats within a, a defined area so that when the female is finally ready to mate, uh, they're all within close proximity of each other. Scent marking at this stage seems to involve a lot of digging, weeing, head rubbing, and more weeing. This is the first time Kato has ever been in an enclosure with any female snow leopards since being separated from his sister as a cub and he's salivating at the prospect of what he can smell. Drooling is typical when, when a male comes close to a female that's getting near to being in heat. This is really good because as he scent marks the enclosure, when the girls come out, they'll induce ovulators and consequently, with the smell of a, a male around, they're going to come into season very quickly. It's going to be interesting to see how he copes, particularly with two females. I know how I would cope, but... But I notice it's not the females that Kato is attracting. His intense session of scent marking has brought Kamal, the male that lives in the next door enclosure, out to look. Here we have a, an interesting situation. We have two males next to each other, Kato, and Kamal. Now Kamal sadly has lost his mate and is too close related to the other females here so we can't at the moment use him for breeding. But the fact that they are in adjoining enclosures has created a little bit of tension between the two. Kamal will realise that uh, he has females next door and now we have a male in with the same enclosure as the females. So, as, as with uh, all mammals, there's always a bit of tension when there are two males are, are available in, in the, the same vicinity as some females, but sadly, at the moment, we have no mate for Kamal. Um, that's something we're working on. After the initial aggressive interaction, the two males are now busy re-scent marking the area. This is exactly what would happen in the wild. As well as being designed to flirt with females, scent marking also defines a male snow leopard's territory and is usually enough to keep other males away. Fighting is a last resort. And so, another whole session of digging, weeing and rubbing takes place. 30 minutes later, and Kato has finally made his mark, but is exhausted by the day's activity. Kato is about to be introduced to two females. He's doing a lot of weeing, spraying, as he puts his marker down and lets these females know he's in the enclosure and knows he's boss. But after putting in so much effort announcing his presence, will Nina and Amiga tolerate Kato's macho intrusion? We'll have to wait and see. The wintry weather is still upon us here at the Trust. 
and our snow leopards are relishing the cold patch. Whilst all the excitement of breeding has focused our attentions on Amiga, Nina and Kato, two of the other females at the Trust, Shen and Sharma, have taken a bit of time out to give each other a bath. Although snow leopards are solitary in the wild, it appears Shen and Sharma haven't been told. Quite the opposite. The sisters have grown closer over the years and their bond is often reinforced by taking turns to lick each other. For now, they are content with each other's company. Breeding will have to wait. All manner of strange stuff gets donated here. We've seen dead ducks delivered. We've seen roadkill deer salvaged for cat food. Well, today, Rob sorting through a delivery of well, I'll let him tell you himself. Here at the Cat Survival Trust, we don't just have um, chickens and deer and rabbits to feed our cats. Sometimes we have guinea pigs. Wall-to-wall -wall guinea pigs. Never seen so many guinea pigs in my life. These are from a, a specialist breeder that just has to do a cull now and again because the numbers are too high. So he gives the guinea pigs to us. There's no room for sentimentality here. An animal is an animal, and, and it's the same with the cats, whether it's a guinea pig or a chicken. It's, it's good food. And today, um, I shall be feeding the cats the guinea pigs. That's quite enough of that. For those of you who like your pets small and fluffy, I think we'll leave it there. Now, over the last few days, while Kato has been on the outside, the girls have been kept on the inside and vice versa. This is to enable the cats to get used to each other's smells. But today's the day that Kato, Nina and Amiga come face to face for the first time. Morning, girls. Well, I'm going to let Nina out first and make sure that there's not any violent interaction. The process may take a couple of hours while they test each other just to see who wants to be dominant. Uh, once that dominance is established, then we'll release Omega, who's slightly more laid back. Outside, Kato's busy watching the activity around his enclosure, unaware quite how much his peace is about to be disturbed. Go on, Nina. Go on, let you go. But despite my words of encouragement, Nina refuses to step outside and leaves Kato waiting and salivating for over half an hour. So Terry decides to let Amiga out. It's a very different story. She immediately goes in search of the owner of the new smells. And as Kato and Amiga first lay eyes on each other, they start a scent marking routine. Scent marking is more prominent than ever during the mating season, which is from mid-January to mid-March. Both males and females scent their territories, informing each other of their readiness to mate. When a female comes into season, hormonal changes cause her to emit a specific odour so that a male will know she is ready to mate. Amiga appears very receptive to Kato's presence, so it may be that his scent has brought her into season. But as Kato moves down towards her, she is still cautious. Amiga doesn't take her eyes off Kato as he walks away. But he has spotted something else of interest. 
Nina is peeking out of her hatch. But when Kato moves in for a closer look, she retreats inside once more. At the moment, Nina is, isn't ready for a mating. She's got a few days to come into estrus. And poor old Kato has picked up on this, so we'll leave her alone for a while. Feeling a bit rejected, Kato makes his way over to a familiar face. I think if he could talk, he'd be saying, what do you do with these females? As Kato gets a bit of Terry time, Amiga watches from the platform. Neither of these snow leopards have mated before, so this whole situation is unknown territory. I can almost feel the tension in the enclosure. As Nina listens to the confrontation from down below, Amiga wins this initial argument forcing Kato off the platform. I would imagine Omega is close to being in season. My anticipation is that she will mate first. Uh, Nina will be brought into season by now seeing the male. So I would imagine in the next few days we're going to see some mating activity between Kato and Omega. But for now, the two continue their mating dance. Giving Nina the opportunity to sneak out into the enclosure. Settling down away from the action is a sure indicator that she is not in season and has no interest as yet in Cato the very present male. So it would appear in this particular instance, blind date snow leopard style has gone remarkably well. Terry did not need to go inside with his broom, so everyone's happy and everyone's safe. Nina and Amiga totally relaxed on their platform and Kato has gone inside. It would appear things are looking very, very good for the future. It's a cold, bright start to the day here at the Trust. Terry has been up since the crack of dawn and is on the move, preparing for another busy day ahead. And the big cats that he cares for are just starting to show their faces. It's been a couple of days since our lucky male snow leopard, Kato, was introduced to the two females, Amiga and Nina. Now, Terry hopes that he will mate with one or both of the females, and any cubs resulting from that mating will eventually be transported out to India as part of the planned project to release snow leopards back to the wild. As I arrive, Kato is already outside. It's not long before a tired-looking Amiga appears. She skirts around the edge of the enclosure, keeping clear of Kato. She then paces up and down a branch, with Kato studiously ignoring her. This is mating season. A female is only on heat for five to six days. So if Amiga is in season, then these two leopards could start mating at any time. When Kato moves away, Amiga follows. It would seem that this snow leopard blind date is going well. Licking and biting forms part of a courting ritual and suggests that there could be some sexual activity between these two leopards. Mm -hmm. 
witnessing this incredible interaction is a real privilege. But it's soon over. Amiga may feel rejected, but she doesn't give up. She is a girl on a mission. Pacing nearby Kato, provoking him to react. It is very rare to witness this intimate behavior, and Kato is playing hard to get. Amiga definitely wants to get close to Kato. Eventually, not able to attract her intended bow, Amiga moves up to the platform. But as she goes, Kato also moves. Playing it cool, he keeps eye contact with the flirting female. And then an incredible scene of mimicking behavior. Twenty minutes later, and Terry has joined me. Amiga has moved down to Kato's old position. So Kato, having his seat stolen, settles down next to her. And Terry gets to see what he really wants to see. Kato now is spending time with Amiga. They're laying down together. So they're becoming very good friends, and let's hope they become exceptionally good friends in the next few weeks. As we all have our fingers and their tails crossed for the two of them to mate, life on the outside carries on oblivious. We've seen Terry perform poo tests to check the health of the cats here at the Trust, and now it's time for him to test some cat we, he does get all the best jobs. Terry's found a rather unusual concoction that encourages all the wild cats here at the sanctuary to pee. We use this mixture to encourage cats to drink. It's a trick I use quite often if I want to check some urine because most of the wild cats love this. They drink a lot and because they drink a lot they then need to pee fairly quickly and this is how we collect urine in a rather unusual way. Urine tests are frequently carried out on most animals in zoos or private collections as a good indicator of the overall health of the animal. How they carry out these tests is open to interpretation. This is a very special brew. Making the cats pee is one thing, but to catch it? Well, of course, Terry has another trick up his sleeve. Cats seem to love peeing on a bit of plastic. I don't know if it's the sound it makes or quite what it is, but it's very useful because this is a, a very quick and easy way of collecting some urine to do a test on. So I'm going to place this in the corner and we'll just cover up the edges. It's a rather strange way of doing things, but you can't exactly ask the cat to pee into a bottle. <laughs> now that the wee trap is set, Terry lets Alpha, a young male snow leopard who we haven't yet met, in for a drink. He heads straight for the yeast extract and water concoction. And then it's a waiting game. Nothing yet. Then, after a couple of hours... Yes, we've, we've got some. Not a lot, but there's enough there. After taking the sample, Terry heads back to his lab to check the urinary health of the cat. That should be more than enough. A quick dip of a colour strip in the wee, and Terry is able to determine if the cat has any problems or cause for concern. These uh, strips are very important to give an indication of the general health of the cat. 
You obviously want to check for blood in the urine, you want to check for glucose levels, although tend not Sorry, to Terry, but there's a lot of science here, so let's move straight to the verdict. Uh, and in this case, I'm pleased to report yet again that we have no problem. As night quickly turns to day, Amiga is still making amorous advances towards Cato and riling him. Watching from the platform is Nina. Chewing on the bark indicates that Cato has picked up on a female scent. By the way he is rejecting Amiga, it must be Nina's scent that he is tasting. As Nina keeps a close eye on Cato, the now scorned Amiga keeps watch over Nina. Cato wants to find out more about the owner of this sensual perfume and makes a move up to the platform. Not backward in coming forward, Nina takes this opportunity to get close. Incredibly, we're now seeing Nina offering herself to Cato. It is clear that she has come into season. After pulling out all of the stops to impress Cato, Amiga isn't about to give up. In the wild, females will often clash during the mating season as they search out male partners. And Amiga, as a woman scorned, is prepared to fight for her man. The power of this scene is incredible. As the love triangle plays out, cats around the sanctuary can sense the tension. Even the geese are silenced. Very out of character, the normally dominant Nina retreats. While Cato has the luxury of two women fighting for his attention, next door, Kamal is not so lucky. Having lost his mate Urbis last year, he lives alone and craves female company. But the two females next door are his daughters, which are too genetically close to him for mating. So he will have to sit out this breeding season. As Cato exits the platform, Amiga sets off in hot pursuit. Keen not to be outdone by Nina, she neither wants to share him or give up on him. As Nina climbs down from the platform, Amiga is watching her like a hawk. With one, if not both of the girls now in season and wanting to mate with Cato, which one will come out on top? It's a damp, cold, snowy day here at the Trust. And our love triangle of snow leopards, Nina, Amiga and Cato, have ventured out to sample the British weather. With one male and two females in the same enclosure, Terry hopes that at least one of the girls will become pregnant 
and any cubs produced would become a major part of his plans to eventually release snow leopards back to the wild. And these extremely damp conditions don't appear to have distracted the three from their rather heated courting behaviour. As Nina and Amiga look on, Kato casually strolls between the two ladies. Launching Amiga into a bit of a scent marking scrape. And winding up Nina into one of her trademark hissy fits. But today, I'm going to have to leave these three to work out their issues, as Terry has another breeding project with the Trust's European Lynx that needs immediate attention. It's not uncommon for cats to be swapped or exchanged between collections and zoos for breeding purposes. There is a mutual cooperation between the people involved to facilitate this movement, which is always to the benefit of the animals. Perfect. This aspect of the world he is involved in is very important to Terry, and today he is losing his beloved European lynx, Luffy, to a private collection in Cornwall. Well, what the, the Trust is all about is ultimately pairing off cats, particularly where there's a need, and there aren't too many European lynx in captivity throughout Europe at the moment. Quite a, an emotional time for me. We've had him here for 12 years, and uh, finally we found him two young ladies, not just one. He's going to be a happy boy. European lynx are one of the widest range in cats, found not only in Russia and Central Asia, they also live closer to home in Western Europe. So for Luffy, adapting to Cornwall climes won't be a problem. The Cornwall Nature Conservancy, run by Tony and Cherry Blackler, is a passion project, just like Terry's Cat Survival Trust. The three have never met before, but as the couple show Terry around their sanctuary, it is obvious there is a mutual love of cats. Although Cherry's obsession may just go that one step further than Terry's. When their favourite serval, Keto, passed away, they just couldn't bear to let go. People do think it's strange, but I think we're probably strange people. Because <laughs> we've got lots of strange things. Outside, Tony is taking Terry to meet the ladies that Luffy the Lynx will soon be loving. There she is. Well, there's wow. one. Wow. Isn't she gorgeous? You're in for a treat, yes. Yes. I'm very happy that Luffy's coming here. These are in absolutely excellent condition. Obviously, very well looked after. We've just got Luffy in, inside his new uh, enclosure and we're just about to let him outdoors with the two girls. As the door is open to let Luffy loose, one of the girls heads straight inside to greet him and ask if he wants to come out to play. It was absolutely fantastic. He's just looping around. And they're both interested, but not frightened. I'm certainly very happy at how quickly he's settled in. I mean, this is an instantaneous uh, introduction. He's just exploring the territory. Once he, he's established where he is and uh, knows where his boundaries are, and done a bit of scent marking around the corners, I think his mind will turn to other things. Ecstatic. Absolutely delighted. I just feel that we sing from the same hymn sheet, and I'm so grateful to you. And uh, when I look at you, well, you could we're like be a brother. brothers. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> like brothers. Another happy cat is the female serval called Kathy, who may not be too happy for long, as she's about to embark on a lengthy journey back to the trust with us. It's quite a wrench because we've had her since she was six weeks old. My wife particularly had her at night and looked after her at all times. And we had her in the front room. And oddly enough, our Labrador dog, which looked after her, a Labrador bitch, actually came into season because she was looking after this little kitten. And she thought that was a baby. It's hoped that Kathy will breed with the trust male serval, Zulu. 
an important part of the work carried out by all such animal sanctuaries. A six hour journey followed by a good night's sleep and I'm back at the trust. Having brought the female serval back from Cornwall, it's now time to introduce her to our new male. So the plan is to block off the doors of the corridor, let Cathy out and lead her the only way she can go, which is to Zulu's inside enclosure, while he's safely locked outside, which will give her time to get used to the new space and the smells. Well, the best laid plans. There she goes. While the confused and scared Serval settles into her new home, Terry uses his incredible hair brushing trick to calm her down. Outside, the male Serval, Zulu, has sensed that there is something fishy going on. Doing his usual thing of hissing and growling, it's hard to know whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood. But his life is about to get interesting. I think now she's realised the hatch is open, she might go out on her own. I don't want to push her. Um, this has got to be her experience. And so, as Zulu waits, Kathy slowly moves to look out the hatch. When she feels ready, she makes a dash for it which is something these servals seem to love to do. So after initial charging around outside, they've come inside. You've got our Cornish lady settling down with our Scottish gentleman and uh, who knows, in the future, some, uh, some serval cubs. It's late afternoon and I'm up at the breeding enclosure. Nina is on the platform, watching on, as down below, Amiga's persistence has paid off. Kato now only has eyes for her. Amiga is giving Kato all the right signals, but just as he stands to mate for the first time, she sits down. Amiga is not ready just yet. But she's quick to return. Strolling boldly up to Kato, she offers her head in deference. Maybe this time. Once more, he stands. But once more, she sits down. This is testing his patience, and it shows. As they continue their mating dance, there is a constant shift in their dynamics. This time, Amiga takes the lead and is persistent. Constantly nudging Kato's rear end suggests this could be the exact time she needs to mate. Perhaps still smarting from Amiga's earlier rejections, this time, Kato refuses to respond. Taking a different approach, Amiga spreads her scent to advertise her new availability. But she is rebuffed again. As the light starts to disappear from the sky, the courting couple step up their game. Kato is interested again. Really interested. He's obsessed by Amiga's scent.
licking the alluring perfume she spread earlier and rubbing up against it. It seems he just can't get enough of her. The light is fading fast and I'm struggling to get clean pictures. But I can't stop now. While Amiga rolls playfully, she can't take her eyes off him. Then, after all this build-up, our leopard lovers finally appear to get it right. As Kato attempts to mount Amiga, this time she doesn't spurn his advances. But just at the crucial moment, he stops. Not quite the outcome Amiga was hoping for. As the two leopards work out what to do, I'm going to leave them alone for several weeks. And fingers crossed, when I come back in spring, there will be signs of snow leopard cubs. It's been some weeks since I last visited Terry and the cats here at the Trust. And by the look of things, everything is carrying on in typical Cat Trust style. The sun is shining and spring is in full bloom. As the butterflies and the bees buzz around, Nina and Amiga are napping. When I last saw them, they were very active in the breeding season. So maybe they're pregnant and conserving energy. They don't look like they want to be disturbed, so we'll catch up with them shortly. Next door, and wide awake, the twins still appear to have spring very much in their step. When we first met Toffee, the young puma from Exmoor Zoo, he was just six months old. When he first came, he was really edgy, really sort of not too sure what this was all about. But Terry was quick to use his incredible calming techniques to soothe the hissing young puma cub. Once calm, Toffee was introduced to the two female pumas, Mum Kit Kat and Daughter Crunchy, who were clearly unimpressed with the very vocal young interloper. Toffee soon settled in and started growing and growing and growing and growing. Toffee has come on really well. He's now an absolutely majestic, full-grown male. He's integrated really well with the two females. They accepted him very, very quickly. And things have certainly moved up a gear recently in the puma enclosure, with the in-heat crunchy paying Toffee particular attention. In the past few weeks, there's been an interesting development in his behaviour. They're watching each other very carefully, they're smelling each other's pheromones, they're nudging each other. It, it's, it's like a new love, a new passion for him. Unlike snow leopards, pumas can come into season several times throughout the year. This loud wailing is a mating call and is a clear indicator that Crunchy is in season and ready to mate. In the wild, her call will be heard for miles, calling out to males in the vicinity to let them know that she's ready. But for the moment, it appears she can't even attract the attention of the male sitting right next to her. Despite trying to ignore her very vocal calls and the blatant way in which she offers herself to him, Toffee does start to take an interest in the smells left by Crunchy. The pheromones left by her scent marking on the branches have made his instincts kick in. And he responds in kind by leaving his own scent behind. This scent almost gives him a sense of euphoria, and so he will seek out where the, the female has sprayed, because he can tell from that scent at which point she is most likely going to accept him. 
Chewing the bark where Crunchy has marked is a sure sign that he is getting excited by the taste of her scent and is a very positive indicator that Toffee is reaching sexual maturity. Toffee is still learning, he's still quite young. We're probably on the edge of a point at which his sperm will be viable. But now he's beginning to show the right sort of interest in them. So I think before long, we're going to see some young puma cups. With the mention of puma cups, I'm brought right back to my main reason for being here. When I was last here, it was the snow leopard breeding season, and I spent weeks trying to capture footage of Kato mating with either Nina or Amiga. Look, look, look. Despite getting close, I never quite captured that moment, although the snow leopards were getting on like a house on fire, so there was great hope for successful breeding. It's now way beyond the 90-day gestation period of a snow leopard, and the sad reality is that neither Amiga or Nina became pregnant. So, unfortunately, this year, there'll be no snow leopard cubs. But, as expected, Terry has plans and is ever the optimist. Of course, it's quite disappointing that we didn't have cubs this year, but next year could be quite extraordinary. Already, Nina and Omega with Kato, and now the possibility uh, and, and advanced stages of getting a, a male for Tammy, uh, Shan and Sharma here, with five females that could potentially all produce cubs. It doesn't take much to work out how many cubs could arrive here next year. The prospect of several cubs, or even just one litter, keeps Terry's plans for the snow leopard breeding project out in India alive. His aim to eventually release snow leopards back to the wild is not something that could be quashed by disappointment. When you see a cat like Kato, could you not do anything but try and help the species? It's almost like he's asking for help. And to, to try and help this species in the wild and, and to ensure that it survives for the foreseeable future has to be my main aim. Over the last year, I've witnessed some incredible behavior with both cats and humans. As a wildlife filmmaker, I've never been so privileged as to witness the endearing connection between one man and his big cats. Once the other side done. My overwhelming memory as I leave is of the absolute passion that Terry and his team have for these fantastic felines and I can't wait to come back. But as I pack away my camera equipment for one last time, a strange and yet familiar sound resonates from Terry's house. Here we have a five day old kitten, unfortunately rejected by its mother. So I've been hand rearing these. And this of course is good practice, just in case future cubs from the snow leopards might need this care and attention. No, no, no. <coughs> Don't leave me, Terry. Nah, I'll look at that, look. <laughs> Speak to my agent. <laughs> yeah.